Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I hope you're having a fantastic day. This is the very first part in my series on how to use Unreal Engine to create cinematic movie sequences. First of though, quick reminder, you can use the chapters or the timestamps below to jump to anywhere in this video that you want so you can skip all of my waffle. Why Unreal Engine? Well, I've actually been using Unreal Engine for quite a few of my recent projects and Unreal Engine, I hope that doesn't need to be said, looks absolutely amazing. If you've got a well set up scene, it looks photorealistic, it's absolutely mind blowing and Unreal Engine is being used for Hollywood movies and big budget TV shows such as The Mandalorian. Unreal Engine is also absolutely free. All you need is an Epic Games account, which you can sign up for free and then either manage your games library or alongside all of your games, you can download Unreal Engine and use it to create games or like me, tinker with visual effects and film projects. Now, Unreal Engine also has a couple of downsides. The main one I've experienced as a newbie when I first started is that it is a rather complex program. The interface can be overwhelming. There's a lot of detail in everywhere, so it can take a little bit to get into, but I'm making this series to hopefully make this really easy. If you're just new to Unreal Engine, you haven't used it before, or you've just tinkered a little bit, hopefully this series will make it really nice and easy for you to get the most out of it. Now, in order to work easily within Unreal Engine, you also do need a pretty decent computer with a good graphics card. But you can get started on very little and I'll drop you links to all of the information that might be relevant to getting started with Unreal Engine down below the video so you can go and check that out. Now, in this part, which is part one of the series, I'm going to cover all of the very basics of Unreal Engine. How to get started, how to get set up, how to create your first project, work with objects, light, move things around, how the interface works, all of the basics that you need to start tinkering your stuff with Unreal Engine is going to be what I'll cover in this part. But now I feel like there was plenty of waffles. Let's jump right into it. In order to use Unreal Engine, you first need to install it on your computer. For that, head over to epicgames.com and click the big blue download button in the top right hand corner to download the Epic Games installer. If you have all of that set up already, even easier. If not, install the program, launch it and then sign in with your free Epic Games account or create one if you don't have one already. Once you sign in, on the left hand side of the Epic Games launcher, you will find a tab for Unreal Engine. Click on that and you'll see a ton of information for Unreal Engine, articles, tutorials and more. Across the top of the interface, you'll find a row of different tabs, one of them called Library. In here, you will find all of the versions of Unreal Engine that you have currently installed, which is none for me, as well as a list of all of your projects and any assets that you may have purchased on the Unreal Engine marketplace. You can click on the plus icon next to Engine Versions to install a specific version of Unreal Engine or simply click on the big yellow Install Engine button in the top right hand corner, which will then install the latest version of Unreal Engine on your computer. Now this might take a while as Unreal Engine is pretty big, but once all of that is done, you can now click on the launch button on the specific engine version or click launch engine in the top right hand corner to fire up Unreal Engine. You will now see the Unreal Project Browser where you can open up one of your recent projects or create a new one based on a number of different templates for games, film, architecture, design or simulation. Let's jump into the film slash video and live events category and select the blank template. On the right hand side, make sure that you tick the checkboxes for starter content and ray tracing to make sure that your project starts out with some basic assets that we can use and that real time ray tracing is enabled. At the bottom, give your project a name. I'm going with learning Unreal in one word and then click create. Now Unreal will create and set up your new project and this might take a little while for me around about five minutes, but don't worry, this only happens the first time you create your new project. And then we're finally in Unreal Engine. Let's have a very quick look around the interface. At the very top, you will find the main menu bar and just like in any other program, you'll find all of the most important operations for Unreal Engine in here. Opening and closing projects, managing the interface, tools, compiling levels and more. In the very center of the interface, you will find a big 3D view where you can navigate around your 3D world and we'll get to all of that in just a moment. Over in the top right hand side, you will find the outliner where you can see a hierarchical representation of all of the objects in your current scene. Below the outliner, you will find the details panel where right now you can't see anything because we haven't selected anything yet. So let's simply left click on the floor in our 3D view. And now in the details panel, you will see all of the properties of the currently selected object, which is our floor. At the very bottom of the interface, you'll find a few hidden helper windows. The most important one you should probably know about is the content drawer that you can open up by simply clicking on it. In here, you'll find all of the scenes, meshes, materials, textures, sounds and other assets that are part of your project. And from here, you can then easily add them into your scene. You can close the content browser again simply by clicking on the button again. 
that was a super quick look around and don't worry, we'll get to all of these in a little bit more detail throughout this series. Let's move on to how to work with the big 3D view in the middle of the interface. The 3D view shows you a rendered 3D preview of your final level. If you click and hold your right mouse button, you can drag to look around the scene with your camera. With the right mouse button still pressed, you can then use the WASD keys on your keyboard to move around the world and you can also use E and Q to move the camera up or down. Alternatively, you can click and hold the left mouse button and drag to look left and right or moving the mouse forward and backwards moves the camera forward and backward. You can also click and hold the middle mouse button and drag to strafe the camera around the scene. You can select any object in your 3D world simply by left clicking on it and if you're ever lost and looking for an object, you can press the F key on your keyboard to focus in on the selected object. This is super useful if your camera is looking way off. You can, for example, come into the outliner in the top right hand corner, select the object you want to see, let's pick player start, and then press F to focus your 3D view on it. If you find your camera is moving too fast or too slow, you can also adjust the camera movement speed up in the top right hand corner of the 3D view. Do note that the 3D view does not, by default, execute any game logic or run scripts and events. To play this level, press the big green play button just on the top of the 3D view. You will be spawned at the position of the player start object and you can then move around the scene like you could before. But, and this is not really obvious right now as we have no game logic in our level just yet, Unreal Engine will now also execute physics, events and triggers and other game logic that you might have in your level. To exit play mode, simply hit escape. Cool, let's talk about creating objects. In order to add objects to your level, come up above the 3D view and select this icon here of a cube with a green plus icon that says quickly add to project. In the pop-up that appears, you'll find tons of different things that you can add to your level, but for now, let's come into shapes and select cube. This will add a simple cube into your scene. You can see a little arrow gizmo in the center of the cube because we're currently in select and translate mode. You can change your mode between select, select and translate, select and rotate and select and scale up here in the 3D view or highly recommended, just use the shortcut keys Q, W, E and R. In select mode, you can only select objects. In select and translate mode, you can select objects and then click on the gizmo and drag on any of the axes to move them around your 3D scene. In select and rotate mode, you can use the gizmo to rotate the object and no surprise, in select and scale mode, you can use the gizmo to scale your objects. Note that you can either drag a single axis off any of the gizmos, but you can also scale in two axes or all three axes at once, depending on where on the gizmo you click. Also, if you don't like the snapping that happens by default, you can disable snapping for translation, rotation and scaling up in the top right hand corner of the 3D view. Let's add a sphere to the scene by going to the quickly add to project button and selecting shapes sphere. The sphere got added, but it's stuck underneath our floor. So let's press F to focus on it. In select and translate mode, which you can enable by pressing W on your keyboard, move the sphere up and then position it in your scene wherever you like. I might scale it up a tad as well. Let's do the same thing and add a cylinder. Again, it's tucked away a little bit, so let's move it closer and higher and I might also rotate it a little bit. Shortcut R to get into rotation mode. And that's not too bad. You can also select multiple objects by holding down control on your keyboard and left clicking on the objects. You can then move, rotate or scale all of those objects together. Pressing escape with your cursor over the 3D view will unselect everything. You can marquee or box select a bunch of objects in your scene by holding down control and alt on your keyboard and left click dragging in your 3D view. Again, press escape to unselect everything. And note that you can also select objects in the outliner and holding down control will select multiple objects. Let's unselect everything again and do something about our new objects looking all exposed and naked. Let's assign some materials to them. For that, click on the content drawer tab at the bottom of the interface and go to the starter content. If the icons in the content drawer are a little bit too big in your folder view, simply hold down control and scroll on your mouse wheel to make them a little bit smaller. Let's navigate into the materials folder. In here you'll find a ton of nice looking materials that you can use as a starting point. Let's apply them to the objects in our scene and for that let me get the sphere a little bit better into view and the content drawer hides away by default because you clicked outside of it. No biggie, simply click on it again to bring it up. Let's select the gold material and simply drag it from the content drawer directly onto the sphere in your 3D view. Nice, that looks great. Let's bring up the content drawer again and assign a steel material to the cylinder. 
Let's repeat this one more time and this time let's assign a burnished steel material to our cube. Now if this constant hiding of the content drawer just drives you nuts, you can open the drawer and select Dock in Layout in the top right hand corner. This will pop up an independent floating panel for the content drawer and you can move this around your screen to anywhere that you want and it won't collapse. You can also drag this panel to anywhere in your interface and dock it right in. For example, let's drag it to the bottom of the 3D view. It's now permanently docked in here and you can simply click and drag on the borders to make it larger or smaller. Let's assign a material to the floor as well, maybe this marble material. Cool, that looks pretty nice. Let's click on the little X on our docked content drawer to hide it away again, but feel free to keep it around if it makes you feel more comfortable. Let's talk about another way to apply materials and tweak many, many more parameters of your objects using the details panel. Select the gold sphere in your scene. In the bottom right hand side of the interface, you can see that all of the properties of the sphere are now displayed in the details panel. Now Unreal Engine objects have a ton of properties and you can extend this to your heart's content with custom properties to control anything from material properties to rendering, game logic and more. But let's stick to the basics for now. You can quickly filter down the properties to specific categories using these pills at the top, but for now let's simply select all. At the top of your properties you will find the transform and you can click and drag left and right in any of these values to adjust them. So we can also reposition our sphere from here. You can also type a value directly in here, but let's leave that for now. Let's scroll down a little bit and you can now tweak a ton of properties in here. For example, what mesh is used for this object or what material is used. And you can simply click on the value for the material property, a little window will pop up and you can find the material you like directly in here by scrolling or type your search text at the top and then simply click on the material to assign it to your object. And that's easy. But I do much prefer the warming glow of the gold, so I'll hit Ctrl and Z to undo that. And then you can go down the list and dig through all of the properties and play with them and I highly recommend you experiment as much as you can to get familiar with some of these. Just for fun, let's simply enable the Simulate Physics property on the sphere. But nothing happens. That's because physics are only executed when you play back your level, so let's play our level back and, oh, there was something, let's turn around and there's our big ball of gold rolling off the edge of the world. Bye bye ball. Okay, let's hit escape to exit play mode and let's turn around our player start object so that when we do play the level, we're actually looking at the objects as they are falling down. Let's also move this player start object back a little bit further from where the objects will drop. And I think that should work just fine. Now let's also add physics to the other objects in our scene. Select the cube, hold down control and select the cylinder as well. And in the details panel, you'll now see that it says multiple since we have multiple selected objects. Whenever you select multiple objects in Unreal Engine, the details panel will display only the properties that are shared and common between the objects that you have selected. Both of these objects support the simulate physics property. So let's enable that and let's hit play. And now we can see all of our objects tumble to the floor and roll around our 3D world. And that is pretty cool. Let's hit escape to get back to our normal 3D view. As a last step in this part of the series, let's check out the sky, the lighting and the atmosphere in our scene so that you know how to tweak it to your liking. Jump into the outliner and there's four objects in your scene that are relevant. The atmospheric fog object controls the fog in your scene and the color and light absorption of the atmosphere. If you click on the little eye icon in the outliner next to the atmospheric fog, you can toggle its visibility on and off to see what it does. In the details panel you can see all of the properties of the fog that you can adjust. I won't go through all of these detailed settings here. Try tweaking the atmosphere height, the Rayleigh scattering coefficient or the MIE scattering scale and I have no idea whether I'm pronouncing this correctly and this will change the look and feel of your atmosphere. But it might be a little bit hard to truly see the effects here since we don't have a terribly large scene set up yet. Next select the light source object. This directional light represents the light coming from the sun. Let's press F to focus on it and zoom in a little bit. You can see that it's a directional light because it has a big arrow pointing in the direction of the light. If you follow this arrow backwards, you can see the sun is positioned in the sky exactly where it needs to be to cast light in the direction defined by this light source. If you rotate this light source, you can see that the highlight for the sun is moving in the sky, but for some reason the sun is not and I'll get to the why of that in just a second. Let's rotate the light source so the sun is just above the horizon and let's zoom out a little bit so we can see our scene a bit better. Let's adjust the intensity of the light source as well to create a nice evening feel. 
And now let's fix the sun being in the wrong spot. For that select the sky sphere in your outliner. The sky sphere represents the rendering of the sky, the sun, the stars that surrounds your scene. In order to fix the sun not being in the right spot, come into the details panel and click this update material checkbox. And the sun position and the light on the sky sphere update to match the settings of the light source that represents the light coming from the sun. You can also see this dependency because the directional light actor property on the sky sphere is set to our light source. So the light of the sun is driven by the directional light. If you select this light source object in your outliner and hit F2 to rename it, let's call it Sun Light Source. And now reselect the sky sphere, you can see that the directional light actor property now says Sun Light Source because it's referencing that particular light in our scene. With the sky sphere selected in the details panel, you can tweak a bunch of different settings for how your sky looks, but by default, a lot of them are simply determined by the position of your directional sunlight. And that is because the colors determined by sun position property is checked. You can uncheck it if you want to, but you can also still tweak things such as the cloud cover, the cloud speed, the star brightness and a ton more things. So have fun and just play around with this. Let's select the skylight in our outliner. The skylight represents the indirect light coming from the sky itself. If you disable the visibility on this object, our scene goes completely black. And that's because of the steep angle of our sun skylight. If you rotate our sun skylight around a little bit to point downward, you can see the harsh shadows that are now being cast by the sun alone. Enabling the skylight adds indirect light coming from the sky itself and makes your scene look much more realistic. Let's undo a couple of steps with Ctrl and Z so we can get back to our nice dramatic sunset scene. And do make sure that both your sun light source and your skylight are enabled. Reselect the skylight, go into the details panel. Let's tweak the intensity scale a little bit. But if you change your mind and you liked it just the way it was, you can always click this reverse arrow on the right hand side of the property to reset the value to the default. For now, I'm simply going to tweak the color a little bit to something a little bit more evening appropriate. Finally, and this is just personal preference, I'm going to rotate my sunlight source a little bit again to get the shadows back onto the ground. I think it just looks a little bit more interesting that way. And because this now changed the sun position, let's reselect the sky sphere and click the refresh material checkbox to update the sky to match. And then I might also select the floor, press R to get into scale mode and then select the handles between the X and Y axes to select both of those dimensions and drag and scale up the floor to stretch out a whole lot further. Cool, I'm happy for now, let's hit play. And that looks pretty neat for 15 minutes of work. Finally, if you're bothered by these two round mobile touch interface overlays that you can see when you play back your level, you can simply disable them. Exit play mode by pressing escape, then come into the main menu, select edit, project settings. At the very top, search for mobile in the search bar and then disable always show touch interface. Now when you play back your level, those controller overlays are gone and you can see your first Unreal Engine project in its full glory. And that's all there is to it. I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you do want to support me absolutely for free, give this video a like, subscribe, it really makes a big difference. All comments, questions or suggestions, let's leave them down below the video. And with that, thank you very much for watching and until next time, I will see you later.